Welcome, everybody, to our webinar for today, brought to you by the Rural Policy Learning Commons and uh, the Rural Development Institute here at Brandon University. My name is Michael Blatherick. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Rural Development Institute, and uh, we have an excellent um, webinar today, uh, Farm Succession and Inheritance, an Irish Perspective on Policy and Support Programs. Uh, I'll introduce our speaker in a moment. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, this is a web-based technology, so as web and internet and technology tends to do is sometimes if there's a glitch in the system, if there's an interruption in service, uh, usually the program reboots and will put you back into the, the room. Um, we are not immune to this here at uh, Brandon University. Um, sometimes if there is an outage, the program will shut down for about a minute um, it doesn't happen every time. We haven't had one so far this year, uh, knock on wood. Uh, but if uh, there is any interruption in the webinar, please stay with us uh, and we will have it loaded up uh, as quickly as possible. Other uh, points of interest, uh, for those that have registered, I will be sending out a link for the video of this presentation and also a copy of Thomas's PowerPoint so that you can refer to it in the future. So again, if you get cut off or interrupted or you have to step out in any way, uh, we will have the video of this presentation up on our YouTube site, and uh, you'll be able to view it at your leisure. So, without further ado, I'll introduce our presenter. I had the privilege to meet him last summer uh, to the ISERPS conference in Ireland, and Thomas is a final year PhD student in the School of Agriculture and Food Science at University College Dublin in Ireland. He is a from a beef and sheep farm um, in the Midlands of Ireland. His research topic for his PhD and uh, decision-making by farmers in relation to succession inheritance. Uh, this research has been carried out with the University College Dublin and Chagas, that's the Irish Agriculture and Food Development Authority. Um, I will also say, while the presentation is on, um, you feel free to type in question and answers. There's a little box at the bottom of the screen, and uh, there's also a chat function. Uh, we'll be able to have a discussion with Thomas after his presentation and uh, look forward to everyone's input. I know we have a variety of people who are going to be tuning in today from uh, international, uh, Canada and the U.S. So thank you everyone for tuning in and without further ado, here is Thomas. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, so first I'd like to start off by giving some very important definitions and I hope that you'll keep the, these definitions in mind as I go on through my presentation. So firstly looking at what is succession and it's very important to note that succession is the gradual transfer of management of the farm assets from one generation to the next. So when we talk about succession we don't talk about ownership it's just primarily management. And inheritance. Inheritance is the legal transfer of the ownership of the farm assets from one generation to the next. So there is a distinct difference between both succession and inheritance. This is very important. Um, in terms of farm transfer, then this is the processes of succession and inheritance combined. And then retirement, so this is basically the withdrawal from the physical labour and managerial control of the farm. So these definitions are very important, especially the succession and inheritance definitions, and I will be coming back to them throughout this presentation. So if we look at ideally what we're looking for when we're talking about farm transfer, we're looking for transferring the farm from generation one to generation two. And involved in this process, as I said, is succession and inheritance. But if you look at the graph on your screen, you'll see that succession is a huge process. It goes from looking for a successor, identifying that successor, developing a plan, putting that plan in place, and succession process and, and that the success of the inheritance process. So in terms of outline what I'm going to look at in this presentation, I'm just going to give you a small bit of context in terms of the Irish situation in Ireland in agriculture, specifically on farm succession and inheritance and the structural issues involved in that. And then I'm going to focus on farm succession. As I mentioned, it's, it's a key part of the farm transfer process and the biggest part of it. So I want to focus a bit on that. 
And then I want to look at agricultural policy and agricultural taxation in Ireland. And then I'm going to talk about two uh, very innovative initiatives that have been launched in Ireland recently, the Farm Succession and Transfer Guide and also the Land Mobility Service. So to start off and just give you a bit of context uh, in terms of, of Ireland, um, Ireland is really a grass-based farming system. So 80% of Ireland is in grassland compared to 40% in Europe. So this is really our competitive advantage here in Ireland in that grass is the cheapest feed for animals. And it's, it's this green image and this, this healthy system that we're running here in Ireland. So it is very, very important. Also, the agri-food sector in general is very important to Ireland. Um, in 2015, it provided 8.5% of total employment um, and 10.5 billion euro worth of exports in 2014. So it's really the driving force behind getting Ireland out of the recession, which it's been in for the last while. Um, and also, Ireland, Irish produce and Irish milk and Irish beef has been marketed hugely abroad. And again, it's using this green image because we're this grass-based system. So Agriculture is extremely important to Ireland. Um, another big aspect of Irish farms is that 99.8% of farms in Ireland are family farms. So family farming is a huge element of Irish agriculture and is very important in terms of the structure and in terms of how we develop and how policies are implemented in Irish agriculture. Um, and another important point to note um, in terms of succession and inheritance is that land leasing in Ireland. So land mobility in Ireland is poor at the minute. Land isn't transferred very often. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that that I'll discuss later on. But land leasing in Ireland, which is another method for young farmers getting agriculture, um, the system that's very common in Ireland is con acres, so 11 month leases. So we don't have a huge system where we have long term leases so that young farmers or new potential operators can rent land on a long term basis and get involved in it. Um, in terms of structural issues, 98% of Irish farms are owned by men. Uh, so we do have a serious gender structure issue here in Ireland. Um, in terms of the average farm size, then average farm size land is 88 acres. Uh, this is the average farm size in 2014. So from what you yourselves might be used to, it's considerably smaller. In terms of income, then incomes in Ireland are very poor. Um, average farm incomes in 2014 were 26,947 euro. So if you combine this with you know small farm sizes, um, if you're looking at the small family farms and then uh, poor incomes in 2014, and then added to that, really, um, Ireland receives a lot of subsidies and subsidy payments from both the government and both the EU. And in 2014, subsidy payments accounted for 70% of income. So it's a huge, we rely hugely on these subsidy supports from the EU. So then moving on to uh, what is really the issue and the structural issue of farm succession and inheritance. So in Ireland at the minute, there's only 6.2% of farm holders under the age of 35. So they're not a huge lot. And this is probably the biggest structural issue that we're talking about at the minute. Um, in terms of young or farmers over the age of 65, 24.9% of farm holders are over the age of 65. And in terms of Europe, 6.8% uh, of farm holders are under the age of 35, and 34.1% of farm holders are over the age of 65. So I want to emphasize an important word in, in these two stats, and that is farm holders. And I'll discuss that more in a minute. But uh, this is a, it's a common problem. It's a problem that has been increasing over the last 10 years. Uh, this, uh, the age of farm holders has been in constant decline, and it doesn't seem to be improving either. And I suppose, interestingly, a re recent study done in 2014 had identified that 48% of Irish farmers did not have a successor identified. So this is adding to that structural problem and adding to that issue that's currently there. So just if you look at this graph, like in terms of Europe, we're not doing too bad, um, but still we are a long way away from the likes of Poland and the Czech Republic. And um, the percentage of farmers, farm holders under the age of 35 there is over 10%. And um, but again, we're not the worst in Europe. And um, if we look at, I just found the Canadian figure um, from 2011 statistics, um, and that says that 8.2% of farm operators are under the age of 35. So just to put that in context and give yourselves an understanding of that. Um, 
if we look at the age over 65, then again, Ireland is doing a small bit better in terms of that, uh, that we are just on the 25% mark in terms of the, the farmers over 65. So what I'm going to ask is, you know, is there an issue? And this is this is a question that, that is, I've been looking at as part of my PhD and, and that I'm, I'm always interested in responses for because there is this debate over farm holder and farm operator. And it was interesting when I was looking at the Canadian statistics to see the word farm operator. Um, now I'm not sure what this applies to, but in Ireland, when we talk about the 6.2% of farmers under the age of 35, we're talking about farm holders. So they are people in ownership positions in farms. So if we think back to what I mentioned earlier about succession and inheritance, that would be basically people who have inherited farms or taken over farms. But I feel, and um, what I know from, from my research, is that there is a number of young farmers under the age of 35 who are involved in management positions on farms. So they are not accounted for in those statistics. So it's probably not as bad as it does look on the statistics. But there still is an issue. There still is a structural issue in terms of succession in Ireland. Ireland. And basically where this issue is arising from is farmers in Ireland Traditionally, culturally, and historically, there's a number of reasons behind this, but farmers have a high level of attachment to the farm. So farmers don't like to stop farming. They don't like to sell or transfer the farm. There's this big cultural and historic issue around the family name remaining on the farm. And again, that ties into the high percentage of farms that are owned by men as opposed, by, as opposed to women. As well as that, traditionally in Ireland, uh, land is transferred on debt through inheritance. So that is another significant issue um, that farms are not being transferred through life and it's only on, on debt of the farm holder. Um, and then due to this fact that there's a really short ownership period for the farmer. So by the time the farmer does take over the farm, um, they're at a stage where they're maybe in their 40s or 50s or a bit further on and uh, the productivity is down and at that stage they have families, they have financial commitments, and they're less likely to take a risk and invest in farms. So there is that traditional issue there. In terms of some of the findings from my study to date, communication is a massive issue, and that's probably the biggest issue that's hindering succession and inheritance, that there's a lack of communication between family members. The conversation is never started, and it's afraid to be started about who will get the farm and how the farm will be transferred over. There's also a lack of information out there, specifically around succession. And I suppose succession seems to be a new concept for farmers here in Ireland. Um, a survey that I did of farmers found that when I asked them to define what succession was, it was over 85% of farmers felt succession was transferring over ownership of the farm. So they don't understand that there's another concept in where we can look at the transfer of management of that farm from one generation to the next. So that's really the, the underlying issue behind this whole thing. So farmers are really struggling to get all these to match up, where they have fairness and equality, where the successor takes over a viable farm that's financially viable, where there's financial and emotional security for both the farmer, uh, siblings, the successor, and maybe grandparents, and communication as well, that there's effective communication and that the issues are discussed. So there, it's... It is a complex issue and to try and get all of these together and that is where the big challenge is occurring in Irish agriculture at the minute in terms of succession and inheritance. So then again I want to bring it back to the difference between succession and inheritance because ideally what everyone wants is a desired outcome if we look at this box here on the right of no, a farm that's transferred without disagreements, a farm that is financially viable, that family members, siblings, grandparents are looked after, and that there's a farm decision making so that everyone is happy with the process that has occurred and everyone is happy that the proper information has been got. So if we look at the two processes then, the two processes, as I said earlier, are succession and inheritance. And there's a number of activities involved with these. With succession, there's shared management and looking into developing that succession plan and transferring over that management in, you know, in a gradual way. In terms of inheritance, again, it's only literally the transfer of assets, so the signing across of the deeds. But the big thing that's common in between these two processes is the communication. So as I was doing my study on 
succession inheritance in Ireland, it, it's popping up everywhere. It's coming up in the literature, and um, it's coming from farmers, it's coming from extension agents, it's coming from young farmers. Everywhere I turn, the big issue that's coming out is communication. So I want to talk then a bit about succession. Given that I've, I've noted the importance of succession in the whole farm transfer process. So when we look at succession process, if you look at any organization or any business, ideally what the succession process is, it's the events and actions that lead to the transition of this leadership from one family member to another in a family firm. So any family business, usually the successor will get involved in the management of that business a long time before they get involved in the ownership. Farming in Ireland is typically different in that as I said earlier, a farmer will only, will, the first time that they might have any management responsibility on that farm is when the farm owner passes away and they inherit the farm. So they don't have that experience to learn and to develop. But what I'm trying to promote is that when a successor is identified, that you start the succession process and that there, there is a built-in process in this and it really depends around, number one, the level of responsibility that the successor is given. And then number two, the ability of the successor to run an independent enterprise. So I'll explain this in a second, but basically this whole transfer process, and as you can see on the right here with the picture, passing the baton can be tricky business, and it really is tricky business. So it's trying to put a process and a structure in place to support this. So if you look at this graph here, now this was um, developed by Ruth Gasson and Andrew Arrington in a book they wrote the farm family business, and it really simply identifies the four succession processes. So any succession process would typically fall into one of these four. And if you see on the left, they're really dependent on the responsibility that the successor has for making decisions on the home farm, and also the ability of the successor to run an independent enterprise to the home farm. And the different options there are partnership, um, farmers buy, which I'll explain in a minute, separate enterprise and a standby holding. So again, I'm sure yourselves, anyone who's involved or has, has knowledge on succession inheritance will be able to understand these and also um, put them in context in, in your own situations. So in terms of the farmer buy syndrome, this is something that has traditionally been extremely common in Ireland. Um, and it's basically where the successor has no level of responsibility and they're just working on the farm, providing a level of farm labor. Uh, the farmer is basically uh, asking that young farmer or that successor to provide labor on that farm and work for that farm and not giving them any level of responsibility. So typically, traditionally, what's happened in Ireland is that um, the farmer will be farming away and traditionally transfer the farm to the son when the son is 40 or 50 or maybe 60 and that's when the, the farmer has passed away. So the problem is the young farmer doesn't get an opportunity to develop and the farmer doesn't get an opportunity to gain some management experience and to gain knowledge in the different areas of management on the farm. Um, typically what happens, because the farmer who takes over the farm is of an older age, the farmer the farm stagnates and then no investment is made. So this traditionally has been what's happening in Ireland and it is a serious problem. So if we look then to the second one, which is the standby holding, uh, this is something that's actually becoming, it's increasing in popularity. It's where the successor sets up a separate farm enterprise on new land. So either they purchase land or a farm, or maybe they lease or rent a farm or land. And there's a number of farm schemes, which I'll talk about later on, which is driving the standby holding. And um, it's a good option for some farmers, the successor, basically gains experience in managing their own enterprise. So they do gain a level of experience, but they have no management responsibility on their home farm, which ultimately they might be taking over in the future. So although they gain good experience and good knowledge, um, there's a lack of knowledge and information sharing about the farm. Um, so the young farmer doesn't get the opportunity to gain some of the knowledge from the older farmer, which is very important in agriculture. We then have the separate enterprise. Uh, this is where the successor takes on a separate enterprise on the home farm. Now, this is not very common in Ireland because we don't have the farm size for this. It usually occurs on large farms um, and it would be very common in the likes of the United Kingdom where they have larger farms. For example, uh, uh, there might be a large tillage farm and the young farmer will take on a beef enterprise on that farm. 
So basically the successor gets full responsibility for the enterprise and they get to gain good management knowledge and experience and they get a small level of shared knowledge and experience because ultimately it's the one farm with two enterprises and the farmer and successor have the same goal which is to develop that farm and earn an income and profit from that farm. So it is a very good option. And the final option then, and this is really the ideal succession scenario for family farms, and this is partnerships. I'm sure people will be familiar with these partnerships, but it's where a farmer and a successor will work together on the farm. They'll share decision making. There'll be a formal arrangement in place which will outline a divide of income, the divide of responsibility, and the labour which each member of that partnership are responsible for. So it's a brilliant opportunity for a young farmer to gain knowledge and experience and skills with the older farmer, with the common shared goal. And this common shared goal is ultimately to have a financially secure and viable farm and a good income for all partners involved. So it gives the farm a good chance to progress and develop, um, increase productivity and increase efficiency. And so it's really a formal arrangement and it's becoming, as I said, very common in Ireland now because it is there as the ideal succession scenario and it's been promoted as this ideal succession scenario and the best option. And there is some schemes that have, I won't say they have been focused on partnerships, but they have allowed partnerships, partnerships to be an option. And I'll explain them when I talk about some of the policy. So really, partnership is based around this um, idea of the succession ladder. And the succession ladder is really where the young farmer starts to slowly get some management responsibility on that farm. So they step up the ladder. They start off with maybe technical decision making, such as day-to-day -day running at the farm. After a few years and some experience and that and gaining some knowledge, they can move on and get more long-term planning or strategic decision making on the farm. Then they can get marketing, you know, they, they make the decisions in time to sell. And then finally, the big thing for all young farmers is having the checkbook and being able to make those financial decisions. And this is something that came out strongly in my research when I uh, discussed this with young farmers and when I had a few focus groups with them. And I asked them how important was ownership. And the young farmers said ownership was not important. They just wanted to get a step on the ladder. They wanted to get some level of responsibility on their home farm and also see that they were progressing somewhere, that they had a ladder to climb, that they had somewhere to go. And to have something that was formal with the ultimate gain for them of getting control of the checkbook or deciding you know, where to spend money on the farm. So that was the big thing for them and not so much ownership. They felt ownership would come at some stage. So in terms of this succession ladder, just to give you a quick outline, you know, when I talk about technical jobs, like deciding how to do specific jobs on the farm, planning day-to-day -day work, simple things like registering as we have on our management has a strategic um, farm decision making, deciding the type and mix of entries, and um, what you know, deciding when to sell rice about the crops and negotiating this price. And finally, you know, the ultimate one is the farm accounts, and this is where the young farmer gets the chance to decide, you know, when to pay the bills, decide and plan maybe building projects or source financing and manage the farm accounts. So this is really the ideal scenario in terms of getting a young farmer involved in agriculture. And this is what we're trying to promote here in Ireland as an ideal succession scenario in terms of the partnerships. So ideally this is what you're looking for. The successor is, is sort of climbing up, is increasing their level of management on the farm on the left here, whereas the farmer on the right is decreasing their level of management. And really, it means the farmer doesn't, as I said earlier, farmers have a huge attachment to the farm and land. So it's a big fear of farmers that they, if they hand over the farm, that they have to stop farming and have no involvement. So by using this succession ladder, it's a gradual process. They gradually decrease their level of management. It's not a big shock to their system. And they still have an input and they still have some development on the farm and they still can have a level of decision making. So that is very important for the other farmer. So now I've gone through succession and the importance of it. So now I might just move on and we'll talk about some agricultural policy in relation to Ireland. So in terms of agricultural policy in Ireland, we're really governed by two 
entities, and that is the European Union and the Irish government. So under the European Union, the Commission Directorate General for Agriculture and Rural Development, we have the Common Agricultural Policy, which is called the CAP. So I'm sure a lot of people might be familiar of this Common Agricultural Policy. Um, it's basically all member states of the European Union come under the Common Agricultural Policy, but each member state, including Ireland, um, has flexibility in how they implement the Common Agricultural Policy and are involved in the negotiation of it. So in Ireland, it's the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine who have responsibility for managing this Common Agricultural Policy and implementing it in Ireland. So I'm going to talk a bit in a minute about the Common Agricultural Policy and the different schemes that have been brought in through that. Also through the Irish government, we have the Department of Finance, and they really look after the taxation policy in terms of agriculture. So no taxation policy comes from the EU. All taxation policy is run nationally by the Irish government. But as I said, the common agricultural policy governs a lot of the agricultural related policy we have in Ireland. And I must note that this policy is focused on succession and inheritance. There is other policies in terms of environmental issues and they are governed by other elements of the European Union. But for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just going to focus on the succession and inheritance elements. So very, very important point to note, because I will be talking about it in terms of the schemes, is this young trained farmer. So in the EU and in Ireland, we have this definition of a young trained farmer. In the European Union, a young trained farmer is defined as someone who has an agricultural qualification and are under the age of 40. In Ireland, the Department of Finance, they define a young trained farmer as someone under the age of 35 with an accepted agricultural qualification. An accepted agricultural qualification is two years in an agricultural college in Ireland. That's the, that's the basic one. You can spend four years in a university and also get your agricultural qualification. But the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, um, they define a young farmer as someone under the age of 40, so similar to the EU, with an accepted agricultural qualification, and also setting up holding for the first time or within the first five years of farming. So this, these two definitions are causing an awful lot of conflict in Ireland because of the difference in the age range um, in terms of the schemes. So ideally it would be better if, if it was all one standard, but unfortunately it's not, and it's not something that looks like it's going to change anytime soon. So in terms of the common agricultural policy then, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the common agricultural policy, it's basically, it's developed around two pillars. So pillar one looks at direct payments. So this is direct subsidy support to farmers. Um, it's really linked to production, so it's linked to the amount of land that a farmer owns or the amount of livestock or or crops that a farm is producing. Pillar two is more flexible. Uh, it works around rural development. So the rural development program, and there's a lot of money comes from the rural development program for developing different schemes. So the key distinctions between it is the common agricultural policy always runs in a five-year cycle. So anything that's under pillar one in that five-year cycle cannot be changed, has to remain in place for the full five years. Any scheme that's developed under Pillar 2 can be changed and adopted and the, the funding can be moved around and used for different, different projects and that. So ideally what you're looking for is a scheme under Pillar 1. So the two schemes that I'm going to look at under Pillar 1 are the National Reserve Scheme and the Young Farmer Top-Up Scheme. And in terms of Pillar 2 then, there's sort of three schemes that I want to outline. That was the Installation Aid Scheme the Early Retirement Scheme and the Young Farmers Capital Investment Scheme. So I'm going to go against the grain now and I'm just going to start with Pillar 2 and I explain my reasons for that. So to look at Pillar 2, as I said, this is the Rural Development Programme. So schemes that are started off in this programme can be changed, they can be stopped, they can be amended. Um, so this is significant in the next scheme I'm going to talk about. So the first scheme is the Early Retirement Scheme. This was denoted at the time as a fantastic scheme and it was outlined that it was going to change the structure of agriculture and it was hoped it would increase the, the land mobility and the amount of young farmers coming into agriculture. So it's a scheme that was introduced in 1992. And what happened is that a farmer who qualified would receive 15,000 euro per year 
um, for a period of, of five to ten years, depend, typically around five years, depending on the amount of land that they had. So if they had less land, they received less than the 15,000. So what a farmer had to do to qualify for this, they had to be between the ages of 55 and 65. So in Ireland, the retirement age is around 65. So I was trying to encourage these farmers to retire 10 years early. They had to be farming, have that as their main occupation for 10 years. And they had to retire from farming definitively and transfer their farm by gift or sale or lease. And um, if it was at least a minimum of five years to a qualified young farmer. So what they were trying to do here is encourage older farmers to hand over their farm to younger farmers and they were going to provide them with a level of income to support them while they transferred over that. The scheme unfortunately was suspended in October 2008 because it was felt that it did not address its purpose, that anyone who availed of the scheme was were going to retire from farming anyway, though it didn't encourage any new people to retire from farming. And one of the reasons it was felt also that it wasn't a success was that it was very restrictive and that a farmer felt if they retired from farming and they availed of the early retirement scheme, they could have absolutely no involvement in the farm. So that was significant because if you note the point I said earlier, that farmers have a high level of attachment to the farm. So unfortunately, you know, they, they would have been afraid to have even been seen out in the farm or out in their garden in case someone said that they were breaking the rules of the scheme. So another scheme that was really brought off brought in to complement the scheme was the Young Farmers Installation Aid Scheme. Um, this was introduced to complement the Early Retirement Scheme. It began in January 1995, so a few years after the Early Retirement Scheme. And basically, if a young farmer took over a farm from an older farmer, um, and they were under the age 35 and met the criteria, they received a once-off payment of 15,000 euro. So to qualify for this scheme, a young farmer had to be over 18 and under 35 at the time that they set up, um, either hold, own the land completely or have a full leasehold title for that and hold the required minimum level of agricultural qualification. So this was a fantastic scheme at the time. It really encouraged young farmers to take over. It did slightly increase the number of young farmers um, going to get an agricultural qualification so they could avail of this scheme. Um, you know, it was a big bonus to get that 15,000 euros a one stop payment. But again, it was suspended in October 2008 for the exact same reasons as the early retirement scheme, as in it was felt that it was not achieving its goal and that anyone who took over a farm was going to take over that farm anyway. So unfortunately, it didn't run at the time. So my final scheme under Pillar 2 is the Young Farmer Capital Investment Scheme. And I might just go back for a second here and note that, as I said earlier, schemes under the Rural Development Programme under Pillar 2, and um, because they're under Pillar 2, they have the flexibility of being stopped or suspended. So that's the reason these schemes could have been suspended um, in the middle of a common agricultural policy term. So in terms anyway, of this Young Capital Investment Scheme, this is a very recent scheme and has been introduced in the most recent CAP. Uh, from 2014 to 2020 and it's where young farmers get a 60% grant for capital investment so if they want to invest in animal housing, in roofing of livestock feed yards, uh, slurry scraper storage and um, a number of different uh, equipment that they can get. Uh, there's flexibility in the scheme again as it's under pillar two so it can be changed and adopted and there could be more added on to that scheme. Um, they can avail of a maximum of 80,000 euro and a minimum of 2,000 euro. So it's a really good scheme for young farmers getting involved in farming to give them a chance to modernise their facilities or become more efficient and, you know, maybe develop or produce a bit more. And again, the eligibility of this is they must qualify as a young trained farmer. So because it's a CAP scheme or a, a Department of Agriculture scheme, the criteria is under the age of 40 for this. So it is a very good option and it's only recently started so in terms of uptake we're not very sure yet. So now moving back to Pillar 1 and again I keep in mind Pillar 1 is the direct supports they are linked to agricultural production and they're ones that cannot be changed for the full term of the common agricultural policy. So in the most recent common agricultural policy 2014 to 2020 uh, young farmers could apply under the scheme called National Reserve to 
get a set of direct payments. So this set of direct payments are called entitlements. So a young farmer could apply and get a set of entitlements to get money from the government. So a set of direct payments. And the value of this is 97 euro per hectare. So they could get 97 euro per hectare up to a maximum of 222 hectares. So if a young farmer had or could source or rent 222 acres, they could get up to 21,534 euro per year. So it's a huge amount of money. And now you can, it sort of puts it into context, what I said earlier, that 70% of farm income comes from direct supports from the European Union. So this is an example of this. Um, it's available on owned or leased land, and the eligibility, again, it's a common agricultural policy and Department of Ag schemes, so they qualify as a young trained farmer, they must be under the age of 30, 30, or sorry, 40, and meet the criteria. And also to have an off-farm income under 40,000 in the years 2013 or 2014. So they were the criteria, and I'm sure the criteria will move maybe from 2014 to 2015 for, the, for this year coming. Now, the young farmer top-up, this was very unique because this is the first time ever in the history of the common agricultural policy that there was a scheme specifically based for young farmers under Pillar 1. So specifically, this is a scheme, this is a guaranteed payment for the length and duration of this term of the common agricultural policy. It was under Pillar 1, so it could not be changed, it could not be suspended like the installation aid scheme, it was guaranteed. So what this does is it provides a top-up payment on existing direct payments up on 24 euro per hectare, per acre, excuse me, up to 123 acres. So potentially it's a 3,000 euro per year payment. And it was a maximum of five years you could avail of this. So again, up on 15,000 euro for five years. So it is significant. And again, it's to support young farmers in trying to pay for investment on the farms or pay for leases or to rent land. So it is significant. The eligibility for this is that they must qualify as a young trained farmer and also that they must exercise effective and long term control. What this means is that a farmer can, a young farmer can rent their own land and they can avail of this top up, but if they, they can also get into a partnership with an older farmer and if they do that, they can still avail of the schemes, but they must sign a declaration to say that they've effective and long term control and management control over that farm. So they're really the, the main schemes that are available or have been available in terms of farm succession inheritance. And as you can see, they have been fairly limited in terms of the new scheme, the National Reserve and the Young Farmer Scheme. This is really the first year of payment for that. So it's yet to be seen how successful they were in, in increasing the number of young farmers in agriculture. But it is hoped that they will have a difference. In terms of agricultural taxation, then, which is another stream of policy for succession and inheritance. Um, it can really be divided into two types. So we have our transfer taxes here in Ireland, our capital gains tax, which is known as CGT, our capital acquisitions tax, which is CAT, and also stamp duty. We also have tax incentives, and there's two primary ones of those at the minute. That is the long-term leasing exemption, and we also have young trained farmer stock really. So there's a lot of detail on these, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about them, but I just want to give you a quick overview. And I want to show you this important point about them. So these are, these are the three transfer taxes, the capital gains, the capital acquisitions, and the stamp duty. These, these taxes all apply on lifetime transfers. Only one of them, which is the capital acquisitions tax, applies on the transfer through debt or inheritance. So as you can see, the taxation system here in Ireland is not very accommodating for transferring a farm through the lifetime. It's a lot cheaper to inherit a farm than it is to get it through transfer through lifetime. And if we look at the taxes, capital gains tax is a tax that's payable by the person who is transferring the farm, let's say the donator, and that's at a rate of 33%, so it's very high. The capital acquisitions tax then, that's a tax that the receiver pays, the person who receives the asset, and that's 33% as well. So again, a very high value tax. Stamp duty is at a rate of 2%, so it's not as high. But again, just the importance of this slide to show that the tax system does not really encourage lifetime transfers. 
Now, there is some reliefs available, and they're trying to combat that and trying to make it more applicable for lifetime transfers, but their effectiveness is debatable, and uh, I can say that they have been hugely effective in, in changing the structure. As you can see, as I mentioned earlier, um, the number of young farmers has been in constant decline for the last 10 years. But in terms of capital gains tax, there's retirement relief. So if a farmer retires after the age of 55 and they farm the land for 10 years, they can avail of this and they're transferring it. They can avail of this tax relief so they don't have to pay the 33%. The capital acquisitions tax, then if a young farmer receives an asset of a farm or a gift of a farm and um, his total assets then are mostly agricultural, he doesn't have to pay this 33%. And then finally, the stamp duty, the young farmer, the young trained farmer relief. This is one that is very applicable and it's a very common tax. And it's a tax relief that a lot of young farmers are seeking education so that they can avail of this, so they'll be classified as a young trained farmer. And really what this stamp duty relief means is that if there is a farmer and he's under the age of 35 because it's a Department of Finance scheme, um, and he has his agricultural qualification, he does not have to pay the 2% stamp duty. So there is relief there, but again, they're very limited in their effectiveness at addressing the issue. So I want to bring you back to this slide again here, and I think this is very important. As I said earlier, if we look at the ideal scenario of farm transfer, we're looking at transferring the farm from generation to generation, generation one to generation two, and we want this to be as effective and efficient as, and trouble-free as possible. And you, as I've noted, you know, succession is so important and there's so much involved in that whole succession process compared to inheritance as it's not such a process. But then in terms of the policies, you know, there is a, a serious disconnect here between succession and inheritance policy. If we look at the installation need that was focused on, you know, promoting inheritance and the transfer of assets, the capital gains tax relief is focused on inheritance. The capital acquisitions tax relief is focused on inheritance. The early retirement scheme was focused on inheritance. And also the stamp duty is focused on inheritance. So there's an awful lot of tax incentives there, you know, focused on inheritance. If we look at the two new schemes, the National Reserve and the Young Farmer Top Up, they're only recently introduced. But again, they're not really focused on succession. They are slightly focused on succession in terms of you can avail of them schemes if you get into a partnership, but also they're focused on a young farmer, you know, taking over the farm and and developing those entitlements and getting the top up on those entitlements. So really what I'm saying is there, there is no specific policy for succession. Uh, there's nothing there at the minute that might support the succession, although it's a massive process and it is the largest process in the farm transfer in the farm transfer system. So, you know, and another key thing about this, as you can see, is that it's really in Ireland, um, farm transfer incentives, they're all, it's very scheme driven, you know, and it all focuses on inheritance. So it is, it is a question that's there. And again, there's debate about what policies could be put in place and, and how it might affect it. But I think again, as I said, this is a very interesting slide, but I'll come back to this now in, in a few minutes. What I want to move on to now is some Irish initiatives, and these have been introduced to help and support the transfer of the farm, but more specifically looking at succession. So the two initiatives I'm going to look at is a farm succession and transfer guide, um, and also the land mobility service. So these are two very innovative and new initiatives that have been brought over in the last few years. So if we start with the farm succession and transfer guide, this is a guide that was produced as part of my PhD. Um, it was developed, I'll explain in a minute how it was developed, but again, it, the hope is that it will support the succession process. So basically, what is it? You know, it's a tool, a decision-making tool, and it's there to try and support succession. There's a number of self-complete exercises throughout the guide. It looks at starting this communication process and addressing the key issues that are involved with succession and starting that conversation and having that communication. But a unique thing about this is that it was created using a co-creation process. So again, I was no expert in succession inheritance, I'm doing a PhD on it, but it was important that 
the main stakeholders and everyone involved in agriculture and succession and inheritance had an input and a feed into this, into the effectiveness of it. So it was created using this co-creation process. It really involved consultation with some key stakeholders, different professionals involved in agriculture in terms of farm transfer, developers, so people who are the likes of extension agents and end users. So they were involved at all stages of the development of this book. And it really has added to the effectiveness of the book. So I know this looks very complex, but uh, this is what uh, we call a co-creation framework. So this is something that we had developed as part of to develop this book, really, and it's a co-creation framework. So I might go through, and I won't spend too long on it, but I suppose when I sat down to develop this book, I done the research, I found the issues that I've explained to you so far about succession, about there being no support, about there being a lack of communication and a lack of information. So I would have sat down first with the head of um, knowledge transfer here in Chagas, um, and they really are responsible for the extension service here in Chagas, and I would have asked them their input into what they felt should be involved in a, a, a guide to succession inheritance. So that was Tom Kelly up here. I then would have met with a man called Frank Murphy, who's head of curriculum development. So Chagas also provides education for young farmers and provides gets them the criteria to be classified as young trained farmers. So it's important that this guide is applicable for them. So then two people would have fed into this here um, where I would have met with the Chagas Financial Management Specialist. So this is a group of specialists within Chagas who deal with farm succession and transfer. They deal with the, the collaboration issues. They deal with the financial issues and all that. So I would have sat down with them and we would have developed through focus groups and um, through consultation groups, we would have developed an outline for the book. That book then moved on and we would have got the experience and knowledge of extension agents, both extension agents in Chagas, which is the, the publicly funded extension agency and private extension agents working in Ireland, and would have got their knowledge and experience from dealing with farmers and they would have developed that book more. We then moved on to agriculture stakeholders. This involved the department of agriculture, it involved the um, mediators, the Law Society of Ireland, accountants, the banking sector, the farm lobby groups, um, it, it, the agricultural universities, anyone who had some sort of an involvement in agriculture, and they would have added more content to that guide in terms of their experience and knowledge. Um, if we then go up here, we I had a keen phone interview with the Department of Agriculture. Again, they're the ones who were administering these policies and it was important that they looked over it. It was applicable for them. And the Chagas Financial Management Specialist, again, would have looked over it. And finally, then, I would have talked to Chagas advisors and farmers and successors. So as you can see, it was a complex process. But what I meant is that we came out with a guide that was really applicable and that everyone had, had an input in it and that is really appropriate and fit for purpose. So I'm currently doing an analysis of this guide in terms of its effectiveness and so far the results are looking very good in that it is addressing its purpose and it is it is making a difference so that is important so i'm going to go quickly through an outline just so you have an idea of what's in this guide so basically these are the, just an outline of the chapters of the book there's the first steps profile of the farm and family a big chapter on communication looking at the management responsibilities, then next steps, farm transfer, and finally a farm succession plan. So th these are some um, screenshots from the book. So in terms of the profile of the farm, you know, it's really getting the farmer to think about their farm. Is their farm financially viable? Can they, can they increase efficiency or productivity on that farm? Can they push the farm a bit more that maybe it will be able to support two incomes or it might be being able to before and then looking at the profile of the family, you know, again using these self-complete boxes, getting farmers to think about who's involved in the family, who has an input in the farm, and um, who expects an income from that farmer, who can have an involvement. So that's really it. The second chapter then looking at communication, very important. Uh, there's a number of reams to communication, why communicating is important, how to communicate with your family, the importance of listening and, and how to listen to what people have said using your agricultural advisor, extension agent, you know, what they're there for and how they can help you. And finally, mediation. So as I said, the communication chapter is big. There's a lot of information plus a lot of self-complete um, exercises. And again, it's to get 
farm families thinking about this whole process and get them involved in it. Just some examples of, you know, it's, it's very graphical as well. A graphic here showing that the family, the ownership and the management should all be of equal value when discussing that. And then something looking at, you know, the fact that if you are communicating to your family about succession and inheritance, it's not just, you're not just communicating, uh, having one conversation, that there's a number of conversations that occur in a number of different life stages. And it's identified here and the different conversations that they should have and the different things they should be looking out for. So then in terms of the management responsibility chapter, I talked earlier about succession and partnerships and the succession matter. This highly focuses on that. Looking at, for example, this exercise here, how we divide up the different steps, you know, the responsibilities that the young farmer has in technical day to day running and maybe a wage income or profit share that's involved in this. So the, the motivation for the young farmer to step up that ladder. Then the next step chapter is look at really now you've read it, you know, how do you put a plan in place? What do you do now? Also the importance of making a will and that's promoted throughout the book because that's a big problem here in Ireland where unfortunately farmers are dying without leaving a will. They die what's called intestate and the, the farm is not distributed. Uh, it's distributed as the state wants it to be and as state rules. So it means that the farmers plans or ideas weren't put into place. So the importance of that is emphasized. And then finally, what to do if you can't get to a decision, because that is a big problem in agriculture as well. And finally then, a small bit on farm transfer. This really looks at, in Ireland, there's huge confusion around, you know, if you do want to transfer your farm, how do you go about it? Who's involved? And there's a number of people involved, from your family to the extension agent, to the solicitor, accountant, the bank, the auctioneer. So what this chapter does is it really lays out in order of priority who you go to first, what their responsibilities are, what their role is, and what you have to ask them. So it's just a, a nice handy two-page document that will outline where you go for information first and what the responsibilities of each professional is. So ideally to speed up this whole succession or this whole farm transfer process and make it as easy as possible. And then finally, we have the succession plan. So a lot of the exercises that are completed throughout the book, they are can be copied and written at the back of the book. This farm succession plan can be detached from the book and photocopied and given to parties. So this is really a farmer's blueprint, what they can look into for the whole succession process and how it's going to occur. So again, I thought it was important to have something like this in, you know, and it can be used and it's it's really their blueprint and their plan for the next 5, 10, 15 or 20 years on how that farm is going to be transferred. So that's really the farm succession and transfer light. And the second initiative that I'm going to talk about here is the land mobility service. And this is a new and very innovative service and it's very unique, I think. And I'll explain it now. Basically, um, sorry now. Um, apologies for that. Um, so basically what it is, is it's a brokerage service. So it's nearly like a, a lonely hearts column um, or service for young farmers and older farmers so that they can come together. So it's young farmers who are looking for, looking to get involved in collaborative farming arrangements and then an older farmer who's looking for someone to, a young farmer to get involved with them in farming. So it's a brokerage service. So there's one person currently employed at the minute and their job is to um, source the older farmers and the young farmers and act as a mediator in between them and, and to develop these collaborative arrangements. Um, so it's a service that was set up in 2013. Uh, the type of arrangements that we're looking at, long-term leasing, share farming, contract heifer rearing, cow leasing and partnerships. So it's all strongly focused around succession and the transfer of management. Um, and the, the slide that unfortunately I won't be able to get up now, it just it shows the people that are involved. So sort of a cross industry initiative that was, was set up. It was set up by an organization called Mochran Firma, and they are the Irish Young Farmers Organization. So they really initiated this scheme and then it was funded by the FBD Trust, which is an agricultural trust here in Ireland. Um, and basically all of the major agricultural industry stakeholders have come involved in this, the co-ops here in Ireland, 
the National Agricultural Newspaper, the Accountants, the Department of Agriculture, and Chavis as well. So it's a huge, there's huge industry support around this, and it seems to be very effective. In terms of what it's done so far, it's only been two years in operation to date um, in only three pilot areas across Ireland. So they, they pick three sections of Ireland to run it. They have currently 360 clients have passed through their books in the last two years. Um, and they've had 138 arrangements, so 138 collaborative arrangements. So it is it has been very effective in setting up this and also addressing the issue of succession. So in terms of just some brief statistics around the land mobility service, uh, the type of client profile that they're looking at, you know, 29% of their clients are expanding operators. These are farmers who want to maybe expand, don't have enough land, want to get in with other farmers or push their farm a bit more. 26% are new and potential operators. So these are the young farmers or the people who don't have a farm or maybe siblings of people who do have a farm and want to get involved in farming and want to get involved in the management and operation of the farms. And then 45% of these are landowners. So these are people who own land and maybe want to get involved in land leasing, hand over their land, uh, but still retain ownership of it. And in terms of the client age profile then, it's, it's fantastic to see such a spread on this. 31% are over um, 50 years of age. 29% of their clients are under the age of 30, which is a high, a huge pro amount for under the age of 30. And then we have 40% which are between the age of 30 and 50. So I suppose a key, um, a key fact that also stays in my head from my research is that farmers are most productive between the ages of 35 and 45. So if you look at these stats, it means that you're getting really productive farmers into agriculture, into management, uh, decision-making roles on farms, so it is making a difference. In, ter in terms of the type of arrangements, um, the biggest one is long-term leases, and as I said in Ireland, it, traditionally they have this system of Conacre, where it's only on an 11-month lease, and this is not very good for young farmers, and it's not really promoting a young farmer on only a con acre cannot invest in that farm because they're not sure what will happen the next year. So develop a long, to develop a long-term lease or to get into a long-term lease is a, is a huge advantage for the farmer. And um, there's also 17% are farm to farm. So this is the, just the transfer of a farm from an older farmer to the younger, younger farmer. 17% of them are getting into share farm arrangements. Um, and then 25% are getting into partnerships. So there's a nice spread of the type of arrangements. So as you can see, it is very effective and it is making a difference. And it is a very innovative service and is something that has been watched on by all the industry leaders in agriculture and environment and with the hope of progressing. So really in, in conclusion to this uh, presentation, I'm bringing you back again to this slide and this is this whole thing of what is, you know, we're looking at farm transfer and it's moving it a farm from generation one to generation two through the processes of succession and inheritance. And as I showed you earlier, you know, tax incentives are there for inheritance. And um, we have the policy which covers both inheritance or succession. But the key question now is to look at succession. You know, is this really is there policy can be put in place to support succession? You know, and if so, what sort of policy can be put in place? Or is this the job of extension, you know, through the use and promotion of incentives such as the Land Mobility Service and the Farm Succession and Transfer Guide. So I suppose I might leave you with this question in, in thinking about it. Personally, I think that there's, there is a role for both in, in terms of policy, support and complementing these services, but it, it is a question, you know, and it is something to look at and it is uh, an issue here in Ireland that we ha will have to look at. So. Thanks very much for your attention, and I hope it, I hope it, you're, you feel very informed after that, and I hope that I, I give you an informative few minutes, and I welcome any questions that you might have. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Thomas. That was uh, excellent, and um, I'll just uh, open the floor to all of our viewers. Um, please use the Q and A box or the uh, chat box. Um, I'm also monitoring those, and uh, as questions come in, I will answer them one by one. I know I also have a couple students here from the Masters of Rural Development program here, so 
if they also want to ask a question, then uh, that will be fine. Um, so until we get some questions, I just wanted to ask a little bit about um, kind of the future of the EU as, as you um, are familiar with the programs that you have um, there in Ireland and, and what type of um, things do you think you see going forward or, or changes in the EU? Um, I think uh, is it Great Britain is currently looking at voting on whether to stay in the EU or not or to go separate. So I, I know you're, you're closer to that neck of the woods than I am. And if you have any comments on the uh, future landscape of the EU. Well, I, I think um, that is a, a big issue that the, the UK consider even, and especially because they are probably one of our closest trading partners. And because we are so close to the EU, so it is it definitely is going to be a huge issue there. In terms of the landscape in the EU, I suppose it has gone through a troubled time, but agriculture is so strong in the EU and is a huge aspect of the European Union that I think it's, you know, there is that, that unity there in terms of agriculture. And we can see during this recent common agriculture policy reform and the new common agriculture policy from 2014 to 2020, that there's been a huge emphasis placed on farming. And, you know, he was looking at, at Ireland and how it has developed and how the agriculture has really pushed Ireland out of the recession it's been in. And also importantly to note, you know, the, this young farmer issue, it is an issue in Ireland, but it's also an issue in the EU. And it's an issue that is not similar to Ireland, it's not getting any better. So there's huge emphasis being placed on young farmers getting involved in agriculture in the EU. So I can see this, the cap from 2014 to 2020, as I mentioned earlier, is the first time there was a scheme for young farmers um, in Pillar 1. And I can see this increasing from the next common agricultural policy from 2020 to 2025, where there is going to be more emphasis on young farmers. There's going to be more emphasis on efficiency and productivity and pushing agriculture forward in the EU. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, no, that's good. And, um, you know, I know it's a, it's a fluid situation and who knows where it will go, but uh, that was one thing that was on my mind and I was trying to think of what, what I could easily ask while we wait for our first question. And so I have um, Heather Mitchell uh, sent one in. She's from the Columbia Basin Trust in British Columbia. So her question is, are there many farmers in Ireland who rely on selling their land for their retirement? And if so, what kind of issues arise from this? In British Columbia, land values are quite high and new farmers can't buy into new farms as the cost is prohibitive and existing farmers need to get certain value to support their retirement. So, you know, it's a kind of a, uh, maybe it's a catch 22. I don't know if, um, you know, the, the cost of buying it is so high and it's hard for people to get in, but then you also have these farmers who are relying on that income to retire. So um, are there, are there many farmers in, in Ireland that are in the same situation where they rely on that selling of the land for retirement? No. Um, as I said, Ireland, like there's a huge attachment to land in Ireland and it's probably one of the biggest issues. Um, the word that's thrown around Ireland at the minute is land mobility. We have a land mobility issue in that land prices are very expensive, but farmers do not like to sell their land. Farmers usually hold on to the land until they until death and transfer it to inheritance. So that is not a, a big issue and I, I've rarely come across a farmer who is selling their land for a retirement income. They will just remain farming on that farm until they, they pass away. And again, there's some structural issues in terms of a farmer can receive, um, they can receive a pension from the government while also receiving the government schemes that I've mentioned, such as their the, the subsidies and the direct payments. So this really doesn't encourage them to sell the farm. You know, they can live very comfortably while maybe reducing their production, they're not being as productive, they're reducing the number of livestock on the farm, and they're still getting their direct payments and subsidies from the EU, plus a retirement income. So I suppose if they sell the farm, uh, they won't be getting that annual subsidy from the EU. So it's the systems in place don't really encourage that to happen. It would be great if it did, because it would mean that there'd be more land available for young farmers to 
purchase or get into agriculture, but unfortunately, that is not a, a huge issue at the minute. They just the availability of land is very poor due to that. Okay. Um, and I, I noticed that there are a number of people from across Canada here um, in Ontario, Alberta, uh, I just mentioned the Columbia Basin uh, in Quebec, uh, Cher Jardin, the development of Petit Collectives, um, David Thompson from the Rain Rural Agri Innovation Network. Um, so if, if even if anyone has a comment on how things are different in uh, your neck of the woods as compared to what Thomas has been able to outline, um, I know firsthand uh, kind of traveling through Ireland, of course it's a smaller geographic uh, nation than here in Canada and it would uh, really seem maybe is the uh, the fact that they hold on to the land is it because maybe land is so precious because it's not as as I don't want to say as widespread but I mean in Canada with rural or, or even our definition of rural is maybe perhaps a little different than what you would consider in uh, in Ireland in regards to geography and population densities but um, do you think that that whole notion of holding on to the land is very much entrenched as well because of uh, a limited amount of land base in, in comparison to Canada, of course? It is, yes. And I suppose, but the key issue is that there's, it's more a cultural, historical issue in where farmers like to keep the name of the farm in the family name, or the, the farm in the family name. So, and that's why there's such a low level of females in farm ownership in Ireland because you know the, the farmer does like to transfer that farm into into the son's name traditionally it's always the oldest son and they like to you know the farm has been in the family name for generations and generations I suppose there is a small aspect of that the farm doesn't, doesn't become available but it's the issue is more around that that tradition and also there's a huge fear by farmers and it came up in some of the research I done that farmers uh, are terrified of transferring the farm to their son in case, you know, the son gets married and there's a divorce and the laws in Ireland mean that the, the wife can get half of that farm. So again, it's taken out of that family name. So that is a, a huge concern here in Ireland. Okay, I have um, I have a student here, uh, Otis. He's a master student in the rural development program, and uh, he had a question. So um, he's not on camera, but I think if you speak up, Otis, uh, he'll be able to hear you. Okay, uh, Thomas, I would like to ask if uh, are there any measures put in place by the Irish government to lure more uh, youth into agriculture? Because uh, recently we realized uh, more youth are not interested in uh, agriculture because uh, there are so many opportunities in uh, urban places living uh, the, to the neglect of agriculture in rural, in the rural uh, areas. So are there any efforts made by the Irish government, even apart from uh, the farm inheritance and succession, like any uh, efforts being made by the Irish government? And I do, no, there's not really any incentives there to uh, to get young farmers involved. But it, it's funny because the agricultural colleges in Ireland um, eight years ago were ready. There was a number of them ready to shut down. And um, now these are colleges that are run by Chagas. Uh, these are colleges that provide two-year programs, and again, it's to get to the definition of a young trained farmer that you have to uh, spend these two years in the other colleges. Now, around eight years ago, they were ready to shut down because numbers were dwindling so much and the poor numbers, our sizes were down to 20 starting in first year. Currently, there's around approximately between 100 and 150 students trying to get involved every first year in agriculture. So there is a bit of a disconnect there in that, yes, there is a number of young farmers trying to get involved in agriculture. Um, if you're looking at the ag colleges, you're seeing that these, you know, there's a huge influx of students who are going through the system with the ultimate aim of farming. But yet there is no really in incentives and there's no ability for the young farmers when they come out to take over a farm or to get to get opportunities to farm. And you know, something like the Land Mobility Service is really the only thing out there that's trying to promote this and seems to be making any headway 
an increase in the number of young farmers. Okay, great. I have a question from David Thompson. Uh, he's with Rain Rural Agro Innovation Network. And he asks, how much autonomy do EU countries have in terms of the types of programs they under, offer under CAP? Uh, he says, I know that in the UK it seems to focus on agro-environmental issues, but I did not come across young farmers or succession initiatives meetings discussing CAP in England. Yeah, well, as I said, each um, they do, they will have the Young Farmer Scheme and the National Reserve in, in the UK. Um, these are schemes that have to be implemented. So in terms of autonomy, yes, the, the, the each state member state, so the UK and Ireland, do have a level of flexibility, but they still have to uh, implement most of the schemes. They have flexibility in how they implement them, but they still will have to implement the Young Farmer Schemes similarly to the environmental schemes that, that are available there. And uh, I have from Ian, uh, he made a comment that Canada has currently low grain prices adjusted for inflation and farm debt is quite high. Um, what is the situation in Ireland? Do they have a similar where there's low grain prices and inflation for farm debt? Um, I, I couldn't answer that one now, to be honest, I'm not very sure on the, in terms of, of grain prices. And um, I think it, it really, it, in terms of farm income anyway, in terms of tillage and grain farmers, they're probably the lower of the farm income. Um, and they would be lower than the national average in terms of farm income. But in terms of inflation, I, I'm, I'm unaware of that. Yeah, I was wondering too on farm debt, like in, in Ireland, is there because there's a historic history, of course, of maybe the family farm being longer generations than what we have here in Canada. Is there a, a high amount of, of farm debt in Ireland? No, farm debt is very low in Ireland. And uh, there was a recent study done that I think compared across the EU. I can't remember the exact figure now, but it was very low. I think it was one of the lowest in Europe um, in terms of farm debt. And again, that's like there's other EU countries and um, the young farmer has to buy into the farm or invest in the farm, but in Ireland it's usually transferred across to the traditionally to the oldest son. So what this means is that there's very, very low levels of debt on Irish agriculture. Yeah, and I wonder if that's also maybe a nature of the the, the dominant um, agricultural type in in Ireland, and I mean most most the most. Um, Profitable type of agriculture, I guess, is is cattle in in Ireland. If if I'm not correct, if I'm not mistaken, is that correct? And um, it's dairy farming at the minute. Yeah, dairy farm, dairy farm, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And recently, we've had um, we've had a quota system in Ireland where farmers could only produce; they'd have to apply for quota. So there was a limit on the amount of milk that could be produced in Ireland. So um, last year, the quota was removed, which means that farmers dairy farmers now can produce as much milk as they want. So it's interesting times in terms of the dairy industry here in Ireland. And there's a huge lot of investment in dairy. And in terms of a lot of the succession options that I talked about, long-term leasing and partnerships, they are becoming more common in dairy because, again, dairy is more profitable than beef farming. Typically with beef farming and sheep farming and even tillage farming, um, you will have a lot of farmers who have part-time jobs along with um, running their farm. And again, it's because of that very low um, farm income. Like that farm income is below the national industry industrial wage in Ireland at the moment. Mm -hmm. And um, kind of following on that theme as well, um, for those dairy farmers, and I recall that the quota system has just recently been um, taken off, um, is in Canada we have for the in wheat board anyways we have had a cooperative system and now it's more of an open market system. Um, in Ireland before when they had the quotas, did they have to go through uh, a, a board to to exchange or was it just full open market and you just had to keep within your quotas and and now is it uh, how how does the market work? Yeah, it's still a cooperative uh, system here in Ireland. There's a number of main. Uh, Co-ops. So again, you have to apply to uh, supply a certain cooperative here in Ireland. Um, that was the way it was before. It still is the way now. The only difference is there's no restriction on the amount of milk that you can produce for that cooperative. 
And in terms of marketing, all the cooperatives are managed by um, an organization called Armua, which is the Irish Dairy Board. So they're responsible for marketing all Irish dairy produce out abroad. But again, yes, all farmers have to run through the cooperative system. Cool. Um, well, uh, I, I see that we don't have any other questions on the board. Uh, I'll ask my couple students here. You guys are pretty satisfied? Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, I appreciate if there's no other any other questions, I'll uh, just mention to the group again that uh, copies of Thomas's presentation will be made available to those who have registered and sent me an email address. I noticed a couple people, maybe they're colleagues of yours, Thomas, uh, Bernard Durley, uh, Connor Holhan, and Shonda. Um, if you want to send me your email address, I will send you the link for the presentation and also a link for the our YouTube site where we put all of our webinars up for all to see. Um, this uh, webinar was brought to you by the Rural Development Institute here at Brandon University and uh, we are part of the Rural Policy Learning Commons, a broader network of universities across Europe and Canada to bring you to topics on rural issues. So once again, I'd like to thank uh, you, Thomas, for your time and your interesting presentation. Um, it made me reminisce of Ireland and how beautiful your country is, and uh, I think it's very interesting some of the things that you highlighted, um, especially because I know with an older generation uh, in farming and agriculture that uh, this is a very important and relevant issue for, for everybody, and uh, I think you've uh, brought some interesting points of interest, and I hope that this is helpful towards other people in, in what they do in their work. So thanks again for your time, and uh, we'll conclude this session, and uh, stay tuned for our next one. Our next webinar is on the 23rd, and we'll take care of that. Thank you. Thanks very much.